riding in the car early in the morning, I, uh, about five in the morning, listening to, uh, turned on the radio and it was still on the sports talk show that I had uh, been listening to on the way home the night before. And you get some interesting uh, call-ins at five in the morning on, on talk shows. Some of the people, I don't, I'm not sure they went to bed yet. But uh, the uh, conversation was back during the NFL playoffs and the uh, T-Bone mania was at its peak. And so the caller was kind of challenging the local radio host, and he knew the local radio host uh, ha had grown up in the region and talked a lot about how he had gone to uh, Catholic uh, grade school and high school. And so the fact that this talk show host on a sports station was Catholic was well known from, from his show. So the, the caller starts to challenge him about, uh, you know, why, why does everybody come down on Tebow? You, you know, he's just out there living his faith uh, in, his, you know, in his everyday life. And why, uh, you know, you're Catholic, he, he, he kind of pointed at the uh, host. He said, why is it that, uh, you know, you're not out there doing the same thing? And he kind of did it in a very pointed way. And, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, the talk show host turned on him real quick. He's like, who are you to tell me what I should be doing? I did go to Catholic school, and they never, they, I went to religion class, and they never taught us to go out and preach. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that's interesting. That's quite telling in and of itself, because... They literally told the guy, get off my show. You know, who are you to tell me this? But uh, many churches today are, are more like clubs, like more like closer to the royal order of raccoons uh, than they are to, uh, you know, the, the, the whole sense of it's a building, there's a mantra, uh, we come, we say the same things, we do events together, and as long as we don't challenge each other as to whether we really believe this stuff, everybody's great, and we don't go out and try to recruit new members, we just uh, stick to the walls of the club. But, you know, Tebow, was, he was daring to confess his beliefs in his daily life. His, his, his walk as an NFL football player was, and, and, and granted, everybody who knows me knows him from Pittsburgh, and knows I wasn't all that thrilled having him knock my Steelers out this year. But yet, I did grow to appreciate what he was confessing in his walk, which wasn't, in a traditional sense, a, a ministry walk. Uh, you know, I heard an interview with him where he, he dared to, to say the phrase, winning isn't everything. I mean, you know, we're always taught the Packers mantra. It's not everything, it's the only thing. Uh, but, you know, Tebow was saying, you know, and, and the, the thing that really caught me about him was somebody asked him what it is that he prays while he's Tebowing, so to speak, on the one knee with the hand on the forehead or whatever that position is. And, you know, I, I would imagine a lot of people are thinking that he was praying that, that God would help him succeed. But he said that what he prays is that Father would help him to remain true to who he is and what his daily you know, faith ministry is, irrespective of whether he's going to walk in accolades after this event plays itself out or if he's going to walk through criticism because of the way it plays out. He just wanted the, the, the strength to be able to continue to, to carry on and be true to who he is. And, his, and I just thought that was a fantastic answer. I, I didn't get quite the play that some other things get when they show up in the uh, media, but uh, I just thought that was fantastic, despite knocking my Steelers out. So, uh, let's take a look at some scriptures. Let's take a look at two verses, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, and just kind of think about that talk show host saying that we're, you know, we were never taught in religion class to, to go out and preach. Uh, Exodus 19, 5 through 6. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people of the earth, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Okay? And then in the New Testament, for a second witness, uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye show forth the praises of him that hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. So here's two verses that are, are calling us and telling us that as a nation, we're to be a nation of, of, of priests. 
Now, uh, as I look around, we're certainly for fulfilling the calling to be a peculiar people. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we've got the, the peculiar piece nailed. But it's this calling to be a, a, a holy nation, a, a set apart, a, a priesthood, that uh, at least in this particular case with the radio talk show host, was certainly not seeing it as a, being taught in his religion classes, but scriptures surely tell us that we are to be priests. In his book, The Other Six Days, uh, a gentleman named R. Paul Stevens writes, throughout most of its history, the church has been composed of two categories of people, those who are ministers and those who are not. <laughs> Ministry has been defined as what the pastor does, not in terms of being servants of God and God's purposes in the marketplace, the church, the home, the school of, prof of professional office. Going into the Lord's work means becoming a pastor, a, uh, a missionary, not being co-workers with God in his creating uh, sustaining, redeeming, and consummating both in the church and in the world. So most of us see, you know, have been led to believe this as we grow up, that uh, you know, if you're in ministry, you're doing something along the lines of ministering, and that your ministry as a, uh, in your profession is totally separate. Now, on a uh, website entitled baptized.org, uh, they had a list of... Uh, ministries, daily life ministries, that uh, you know, speaks to this notion of ministering to different callings. Now, when I looked at this, I thought to myself, you know, this really is more of a, of a callings. And, and, and a, the distinction I'm making here is that w we are given different gifts, and the, the, the natural thing that we progress to, to make our lives work uh, doesn't necessarily, you know, could be one of these, you know, land and animals, whether you're a farmer or work animal husbandry, uh, home and family, you know, all, all of these things are things we're called to to live in our daily life, and they can be considered ministries. But what was sticking in my head was more the fruits of the Spirit and the ministries that you, you can have in regard to those fruits. You can be in any one of those callings, and you can have a ministry of love, a ministry of joy, a ministry of peace, that you, is your ministry that you're called to. Uh, you may be called to several of these. You may be called to different ones in different moments. So rather than go through callings in terms of uh, life's vocations, I wanted to take a look at some people who had a, a life calling, but who either through the Bible or I've got some uh, uh, non-biblical examples, just have ministered to us through their, their, their life's work. The first one I want to take a look at is in Acts chapter 16. Uh, this is in verses 12 through 15. This is Lydia of Thyatira. Uh, now, Lydia was a businesswoman. As we read this passage, we're going to see that she was a seller of purple. Now, whether purple here was clothing or whether purple was just a dye, uh, that, that color in clothing was traditionally associated with royalty. So we can imagine that uh, Lydia had a, you know, a high society clientele that she sold these purple garments to, or purple dyes for making their garments that way. So uh, here she is, in, uh, as we read this section, sitting by the river in prayer. And then she turned and saw Paul. And it goes like this. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia and of a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the Sabbath we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, if ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. Uh, so now, if you go down and you, and you pick up in chapter 16, or in verse 16, we see another woman come into the picture. And this woman is possessed with a spirit of divination. And it uh, enables her masters, who I would imagine were you know, stock uh, traders of the day, uh, it was enabling them to do uh, quite well and make great gains through sooth her soothsaying. The spirit that possessed her uh, starts causing her to follow Paul and to continuously declare that these men are servants of the Most High God, which show the way to salvation. And she does this on and on and on. Uh, and even though it was kind of a positive affirmation, the continual bloviating finally gets on Paul's nerves. And he kind of cuts it off. He's grieved. And picking up in verse 18, we read, 
And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, these, these men, being Jews, so exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat, and com, commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they cast them into prison, uh, charging the, sa- the jailer to keep them safely. So Paul's teaching was fine up until the point where because if you notice, they hadn't called him in to be beaten or anything like this, right up to the point where their, their wages started to get impacted. And as soon as their business was disrupted by their preaching, then all of a sudden there's these unlawful things, and they kind of took him to task. Uh, in the verses that follow, uh, we see, as Ron would say, some jailhouse rocking occurs, uh, and the, uh, the, the prisoners had an opportunity to escape. And the jail, jailer who was given that command to make sure that they didn't escape Really, he went to fall on his sword because of the, the Roman law. If he had let these uh, prisoners escape, there would have been a pretty painful death that he was going to suffer. So, you know, he went to take the uh, easy route, and he's about to fall on his sword. And Paul and, uh, and Silas announced that they're still there. And the fact that they didn't try to escape impacts him to the point where he has kind of a conversion experience. And now he invites them to, uh, to his house. So at the end, what we see are two ministries of faith here in that uh, in the face of potentially losing their business, uh, or her business in the case of Lydia, uh, as, and we see that there certainly was such a threat by what had happened uh, to Paul and Silas when the businessmen did get impacted, her business was in jeopardy if it was known that she was housing these, these Christians. And, and with the jailer, he potentially risked losing his job, but yet when that conversion occurred, they, th- their faith led them to bring these men into their house and to provide for them. And so... Uh, you know, their calling wasn't to be a minister, but there was a, minister, a ministry of faith that was demonstrated to us here. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus in on a couple of these, but I want to... Uh, the, the example I had for the ministry of peace was talking to Abraham and how Abraham and Lot had their dispute. And, you know, uh, Abraham demonstrated a ministry of being a peacemaker and offering the better of the land to, uh, to Lot. Uh, the uh, example I had for a modern ministry of peace was one in where a... Uh, Police officer uh, had come into a, a, a new de- had come into an apartment where there had been a long-standing feud between two people, and you know he wasn't a counselor. He wasn't uh, a uh, it wasn't his job. His job was to come in and, and to work with these people, but he knew they couldn't work effic- efficiently and effectively with the way things were. And he took it upon himself first in prayer, uh, and then through action to uh, bring these two together and reconcile the situation. So, you know, as a police officer, he is supposed to keep the peace, but here he helped make the peace, which was a a ministry of peace. Uh, I want to share this one. This one I really uh, enjoyed was this telemarketer's ministry of of humility and temperance. This was off of a website uh, called conversiondiaries.com. And the following was a post from a a, a real college student. Uh, One evening, Jennifer and her college friends were hanging out, getting ready to head out to a party off campus when the phone rang. The caller ID showed that it was a telemarketer, and Jennifer had been getting a lot of those calls lately, so she decided they had some time to kill, and it was time to uh, have some fun at this telemarketer's expense. She hit the speakerphone just as the gentleman went into his pitch for carpet cleaning. She put on her best Saturday Night Live church lady impersonation and said, I don't believe in carpet cleaning. It's against my religion. It's from the devil. A bit hesitantly, he said, well, I, I'd never heard of that. What, what is your religion, if you don't mind me asking? I'm a Christian, of course, she replied, raising her voice. Oh, okay. Where, where do you go to church? That one caught her off guard. Uh, and as she faked an answer, uh, he came back enthusiastically with genuine questions of interest regarding her faith. She glanced to her friends, and her face starting to burst red. This wasn't going like she had planned. The man continued, I, I've got to tell you, I just... I just love the Lord. He paused, obviously getting a little choked up. The Lord has just done so much for me. And he proceeded to bear his soul to her, trusting that she was a fellow Christian, and told her of his, his falling out of faith and the terrible places it had led him, and the troubles, his troubles with alcoholism, and how it nearly wrecked his marriage, and how the, with the Lord's help his marriage was healed, and now he's been sober for 25 months and six days. No longer feeling like, like a comic genius. 
Jennifer abandoned the plan of playing the church lady role and just tried to get uh, herself off the phone as soon as possible. She didn't know what to say. The poor man didn't know he was, taking a militant, he was talking to a militant atheist and a bunch of her atheist friends. I'm sorry, he said again. It's just so good to meet people like you, to come across fellow Christians when you least expect it. Listen, he continued, don't you even worry about this stuff I was trying to sell you. That's not what matters. I'll let you go enjoy your evening. Can I just ask you to keep me in your prayers and I'll pray for you too? God bless you, ma'am. God bless you and have a good night. God bless you too, she stammered, forgetting to use the fake accent and hung up the phone as they sat for a moment in silence. Someone eventually forced an awkward chuckle and someone else mumbled something about the call not going as planned and they all got up to collect their things and go to the party. But before she left, she glanced at the phone and thought of that man on the other end. She thought about the question he had asked her. Do you know what I mean? After telling her about his experience with God and how he had taken his shattered mess of a life and restored it to something beautiful and whole. And as she closed the door, for a brief moment, she wished more than anything else that she did know what he meant. The telemarketer ministered to this atheist in his meekness and in his humility. If he had... Uh, he didn't have any idea he was uh, the butt, supposed to be the butt end of this joke. And if he had sensed it and taken on a holier-than-thou attitude uh, uh, and, and hung up on her or, or, or taught her a lesson, she would have just uh, you know, rooted herself in the place that she was at. But she rocked his world, or she, he rocked her world with his ministry of meekness and humility. And the rest of the post goes on to say that she did become a Christian, and she pointed to that event as the turning point. This one is a uh, story called The Modern Day Job. This comes from, uh, so this is for a ministry of long suffering. This comes from a Time Magazine article. Nashville, Tennessee. In a subdivision in Nashville live David and Nancy Guthrie. They own no sheep or camels, but they have a late model infinity and a widescreen Sony TV. They would never lay claim to blam uh, blamelessness, but they are regarded as upright and God fearing among their friends, who place high value on those traits. Sometimes those friends compare the Guthries to Job. The odds of carrying a recessive gene for a terrible disorder called Zellweger syndrome are 1 in 160. The odds of two carriers meeting and having a child who suffers from this syndrome are about 1 in 100,000. David and Nancy, already the parents of a healthy son, Matt, drew that 1 in $100,000 chance when two and a half years ago, Nancy gave birth to a severely disabled daughter named Hope who struggled for life, struggled in her life for 199 days. After Hope was found to have the ailment, David got a vasectomy. The odds of a woman becoming pregnant after her partner has had this procedure are one in 2,000. If the odds of two people having the recessive trait and having this child, having a child with this trait are one in 100,000, then the odds of having this happen after this procedure are one in 20 million. It was a warm and lazy day in Harpeth Hills Memorial Gardens. Nancy, wearing a pink maternity suit, kneels down to wipe dirt from a plaque reading Hope Lauren Guthrie. Her son lies nearby, hinting repeatedly that Hope's plot is in need of resodding. Nancy wearily replies, you know what? We don't need to replant the grass because we're gonna dig it up again soon. We're gonna have this baby. She glances at her belly and then at the grave. And we already know what's going to happen here. We, we do know what's going to happen. Her new child was due July 16th, and they would most certainly bury him within the year. At Hope's memorial service at Nashville's Christ Presbyterian Church, there was a showcase of faith's bulwark against sorrow. For all the tears shed, one guest called it a victory, not just for hope in heaven, but also for David and Nancy, who had emerged with faith intact. There was, without boastfulness, a sense of challenge met and completion. And then one and a half years later, David and Nancy stood before the con congregation again. David recounted Hope's brief history and reported on his medical procedure, and then he announced that amazingly, in spite of that, we're expecting a little boy. The listeners oofed, and up, I'm not sure what oofing is, but that, that's what it says they did, <laughs> and applauded. Is that Scandinavian for... <laughs> okay. Uh, and they applauded. Thank you, David said. And this little boy will be born with the same syndrome that Hope had. 
quite audible on the videotape of this event was the sound of several hundred people gasping. Evangelists insist on God's active presence. Uh, evangelists' insistence on God's active presence inclines many of the Guthrie's friends to regard them as singled out, maybe in a good way. I think David and Nancy have been entrusted with something he couldn't entrust with anybody else, says Dan Johnson, a Christian filmmaker. He turns to David, I think God is intrigued with your faithfulness. So the article goes on to describe how David and Nancy maintained their faith through these uh, really challenging life events. And it also describes the details of the hard days that they had uh, and, and trying to make it through those wavering moments. But uh, in the end, they express that like Job, we often see the hidden purposes of God, but we can determine to be, we can't always see the hidden purposes of God, but we can uh, determine to be faithful and keep walking toward them in darkness. So the Guthrie's here, again, their, their calling was, uh, uh, they, they worked in a ministry actually, uh, in publishing and in filmmaking, but this ministry of long suffering that they demonstrated was, had such a huge impact on the people around them. This comes from a uh, three minutes of joy, three minutes to joy.com, uh, another website. Uh, this is uh, by a Dr. Melba Colesgrove. She writes, joy is, the spark, is a spark that begins completely unconsciously when your heart, not your mind, is open to it. One of my recent joys was also an example of this when a friend invited me to the Whitney Museum to see Charles Birchfield's exhibit, an artist whose work I was not familiar with. The paintings are truly something to behold. However, it was Birchfield's journal quotes that really struck me. As they capture the, his ability to find joy in every day, in the everyday world around him. So here's one of the quotes. Listen long to the singing of the telephone poles. It sounds more weird and beautiful by moonlight. Each pole has a distinct tone, a steady throbbing sound. The poles, once trees, still are full of life, which, ex which is expressed in this pulsating sound. Seems a voice from the center of the earth. And then at a time where he was uh, in deep sickness, uh, he, he saw this uh, maple leaf that was stuck, or oak leaf, I'm not sure what kind of leaf it was, but it was stuck in the grass outside the window. And no matter how hard the wind blew, this leaf just wouldn't move. And he writes, I must tell you about my oak leaf. In my neighbor's yard, the yard has been raked clean of leaves, but later on somehow this oak leaf got attached to something in the grass. So it stands upright, and, is re and its repeated gales and snowstorms have failed to dislodge it. It bends over with the wind, and when it is calm again, there it is, standing so up so pert and imp-like. For me, it has become a sort of symbol or example, as it clings so stubbornly, so I must hang on through this illness, which has lasted so long. I have moments of utter despair, and then I look out and see this little oak leaf, my friend, each morning, I look for it, and it's always there. So again, he was an artist, but yet uh, his ability to find joy in the simplest things around him ended up being a, a ministry to this woman who went to see his paintings. So uh, it, you probably noticed of the fruits of the spirit in that verse, I skipped one, which was the ministry of love. Uh, and that's because I have a lot more to say about that uh, later on and, and into part two. So we'll come back to, to, to that. But uh, like I said, we're called to be priests according to the scriptures. And so there's this, this ministry element. And I just wanted to share with you these, these uh, stories here just to, to show that even though your calling may not be to be a, a Bible teacher, to be a uh, pastor of any sorts, an evangelist, evangelist, but we can minister the fruits of the Spirit by our actions and by our words in our everyday life. Uh, and uh, I believe that's part of our calling. I'd like to turn to... Uh, Ephesians. And I want to get back to this uh, calling uh, that, we, that, that we were talking about. Uh, Paul identifies himself uh, in, to, as being called to be an apostle. So in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, we see Paul called to be an apostle. So Paul identifies his calling uh, as an apostleship. But uh, he goes on to say, apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all that in every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. 
And again in Romans 15, he says, but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister to the saints. So we see that Paul identifies his calling as being an apostle, but it, it, and in that apostleship, he declares that he has a ministry, but he says he's ministering to saints, and he's identified these saints as those people at the church of Corinth. So uh, when we think about all of the letters that Paul's writing, uh, and we think about all the ministering that Paul does, he was ministering to people not very much unlike ourselves and calling them saints. So think about that as we move forward here, this call to be saints. Uh, if we are saints and we're called to be saints, then where does this call come from? Uh, you know what? First I want to talk to the purpose that Paul identifies. Because Paul does identify the purpose of his ministering to the saints, and, he, and that's in Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. He says, uh, picking up in verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So his ministry to the saints at Corinth was for their perfecting. And that word perfecting comes from uh, the Greek word kartartismo, uh, which means completion or e furnishing or equipping. So his purpose was to equip the saints. So then the next logical question is, what is he equipping the saints for? And that's really the rest of this talk and tomorrow's talk is this notion of the calling to be a saint and what that ministry of being a saint means. What does it mean to be a saint? What are the saints called to do? Uh, what are they being perfected for? And when did this, what, what does it mean to be a saint to begin with? What, what, what is the first occurrence of the word saint? All right, so the first occurrence of the word saints, actually in the Old Testament, it's in Deuteronomy chapter 33, picking up in verse 1. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Sire. Unto them he shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Every one shall receive thy words. So he's using this word saints again for the congregation of people who may have considered themselves as being ministered to by Moses at this point in time. So this word saint is coming from a Hebrew word which has the, uh, the interpretation holy or set apart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we see Paul writing, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that, that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. So James spoke earlier about coming out of her, my people. And here we see a, a, a call at this time to, to come out and be separate. But this coming out and being separate, as James pointed out, doesn't necessarily mean coming out of their system, uh, although it will at a certain time. But it's just coming out and being able to be identified by your faith, by the actions of your faith. And that's what this calling uh, to the saints to be was, to be separate, to be holy. So where did this call begin? Because it's important for us to see, uh, the, the, to, to trace the whole path here. In Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1, we see, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among them, among whom also we ha all had our conversation in times past, the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and he hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places. So at a minimum, this calling occurs when we were uh, in the depths of our sins and separated from him. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, picking up in verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show for the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. For by grace ye are saved 
through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath ordained that we should walk in them. Human nature wants to take credit for the things that we accomplish. Uh, and if that credit, especially when that credit paints us in a good light, and if, if it doesn't, then human nature is blame management and try to make sure we, we pin that uh, bad collar uh, on somebody else. Take a look at this in verse 9. Paul emphasizes, by grace you are saved through faith. Now, we, we always hear this, and we always hear it read, by faith, by faith you are saved through grace, not works. By faith, by grace you are saved through faith, not works. It's always done that way, but Paul didn't write it that way. The not works part was after this phrase, and that not of yourselves, for it is the gift of God. Paul made the point of emphasizing to them that, uh, yes, it is by grace you are saved through faith, but that faith is not a faith of your own. It's a gift from God. Now, it might, not, it might even be, and we'll take a look at this a little further, that it's not our faith either, that it's the faith of Christ, or maybe even better said, the faithfulness, faithfulness of Christ to, do that, uh, to complete his work in us. When the salvation by grace method, message is preached, uh, the faith not works message is always loud and clear. But again, uh, there's a part of us that just wants to hang on to the, the notion that we chose to have that, that, that faith. Uh, we want to take credit for it. And uh, we don't want to treat it like a work because we think, okay, you know, physics says that work is a force pushed through a distance and there was no uh, energy expended here. So uh, believing and having faith, th these things aren't works. But they're works of the mind if you really think about it. Uh, and let's take a, a little further, see if we can find a couple more witnesses here. In Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Uh, Hebrews 12.2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he, he, he writes this faith in our hearts, and he finishes it and completes it. And then John 15, 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These verses reemphasize that it's the faith of Christ that justifies us, and that he is the author of our faith, and that we don't choose God, but God chooses us. And he also ordains that we'll bring forth fruit. So just like we saw in Ephesians 2, the faith through which we are saved is the faith of Jesus. And the good works or fruit that are produced as a result of that faith were foreordained by God. 2 Timothy 1, 8-9. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So, once again, we see the uh, emphasis of this holy calling having nothing to do with our own works, uh, but rather we're called with a holy calling, but we now get the answer to the question when. This calling came before the world began. All of these good works foreordained before the world began. Uh, and it's Christ's faithfulness to complete this work within us to bring this stuff into manifestation. 2 Thessalonians 2.13, we read, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning, again, here we are from the beginning, chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit, and belief of the truth. So it's from the beginning that he chooses us to salvation, and he tells us here that that salvation will be through the sanctification process uh, and through belief of the truth. So do you think this belief of the truth is something that we, is this where it starts? This is what we've chosen, and then everything falls from there? Or do you think that that uh, belief of the truth was given to us as well? Uh, Philippians 1, 29 says, For unto you is, it is given on the, in the behalf of, of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, 
So here we see a scripture that clearly tells us believing in Christ is given to us by Christ. 2 Timothy 2.24 tells us, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves, if God, peradventure, will give, him, give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. So now we see that the apostles are out there, they're ministering, and they're, they're, they're spreading the, the gospel, but they have no idea whether the ears that are hearing uh, their words are, are being opened or not. Have they been given to believe? Uh, have they been given a, you know, a, a spirit of repentance? Are they prepared to turn? And so they're saying these words in hopes that they're going to land on fertile ground and that those words will be the trigger to bring about that change. So then in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you are saved through faith, which we uh, had read earlier. Again, this is your, uh, a gift from God. So the three gifts that he's giving us here, he gives us belief in his son, he gives us repentance in our hearts, and he gives us the faith uh, of Jesus within us and, and this brings about this justification, and this brings about our conversion, and this brings about the sanctification process, which then puts us in a position to have all of these triggers in our lives uh, manifest opportunities to execute the good works that he foreordained for us before the world began. Deep down inside, though, and, and anytime I have this thought, I, I just when I say this, I don't do a good impersonation of... Uh, uh, but if you think about that movie, uh, Officer and Gentleman, no, not Officer and Gentleman, uh, what's the one with You Can't Handle the Truth? Uh, he had a few good men, thank you, where he's uh, on trial, you know, he's just you know, deep down inside in places you don't like to talk about at parties. You want to believe that you believed. You need to believe that you made that choice. But the truth is we can't handle the truth sometimes. The truth of the scriptures is saved by grace through faith of the Father, these gifts being belief, repentance, and the faith of Christ in us, or better said, the faithfulness of Christ to complete that work. Uh, you can read about God's grace and mercy. You can watch God's grace and mercy happen to somebody. But you have to feel it, and you have to experience it to truly learn what grace and mercy are all about. Uh, I shared this in another talk one time, and that being the idea that feeling is a natural uh, enhancer to the learning process, uh, and that it makes learning become more personalized and internalized, and that our physical flesh bodies are r really sensors of, the, uh, of those emotional triggers that internalize that learning process. Remember that the entire rabbit trail that we started here began uh, looking at Ephesians 2, we saw that Paul had declared that he was an apostle and that he was ministering unto the saints. And we talked about that word saint meaning uh, to be separate, to be called out to be separate. So here's where we see Jesus' commandment to what separates us. Uh, John 13, 34 through 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one another. So here's the fundamental question that uh, we have to ask ourselves daily. If we were accused of being a Christian, if we were dragged into church or into, into court uh, with, with the uh, accusation, yeah, dragged into church. Uh, if we were dragged into court or church with the accusation that we were a Christian, and the only body of evidence that was going to be put against us was whether or not we had loved, would they have enough to convict us? Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, I just stood here and told you that uh, all these things are gifts that your good works are foreordained, so I'm not gonna then turn around and tell you that uh, you're gonna earn your way into a convicted uh, uh, disciple through good works and by uh, actionable love. But what I am gonna say is that, you know, the same notion about the uh, apostles and uh, whether or not uh, they knew who had a heart for repentance at the time. They spoke hoping there'd be a trigger. How many have seen the movie The Matrix? Uh, you know, if you think about that scene with uh, the oracle, when Neo goes to see the oracle, and uh, she says, I'd ask you to sit down, but you're not going to anyway, and don't worry about the vase. And he turns and he knocks over the vase. And he says, oh, I'm sorry. And she said, I said, don't worry about it. I'll get one of my kids to fix it. How did you know, he asks. Oh, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? 
we certainly wrestle with the notion of the fact that we feel like making choices uh, and the, uh, we feel like we're making choices and we act upon those choices every waking moment of the day. And yet, through it all, uh, throughout the word, we see God's complete sovereignty suggesting uh, differently. And it's complete and it's comprehensive. So I'm going to submit to you the following weak, limited, uh, limited human attempt to explain sovereignty and free will and how you can feel that. Would you all agree that you were born and or you were, uh, well, we all agree we were born. Let's start there. <laughs> Do you believe that you were uh, designed by the Father? And he designed your genetics, he designed everything, including the logic tree that is the way that you think as an individual. And we all think very differently, very differently. Some extremely differently. <laughs> uh, if you, th if you uh, buy into that, and if you think about the fact that the oracle in the, in the movie experience or, uh, uh, example, she knew the way that Neo thought, and she knew that if she said, don't worry about the vase, he would turn and knock it over. Now, Neo had a logic tree that she understood, and, and yet he wasn't a marionette. He wasn't on the end of the string. She didn't push him into the vase. She didn't do anything. She just said something that was a trigger for him. So this is a Hollywood manufactured visualization of a real possibility, and that is that, our, that you really do have free will. You have free will to choose within the constraints of the logic tree that was designed to make you who you are in the way that you think. And that when the scenarios and the events of life that were ordained create the triggers, you freely choose to do what God foreordained and knew that you would do. You sense it, you feel it, because if you didn't feel it, you wouldn't learn any of these things, these emotions that uh, are, are these triggers for, for learning his will. So you're designed with a way to think and then he presents you with a set of triggers that cause you to respond, freely choosing amongst the option space that you have to choose from, which he designed into you. That's my attempt. God's given you a logic tree, and now he's just giving you the triggers. So back to the point of this chart. Again, daily I ask myself, would I be convicted uh, of uh, being a disciple, being a called one, being separate, uh, if the body of evidence was love and actionable love.